than Lex ever was. Also, ahead of tomorrow's big reveal, President Trump intensified lobbying for a tax overhaul plan, promising it'll be passed by Christmas. Well, tis the season to believe in imaginary things that won't really happen. The Trump Report starts now. You're tuning into the destination for TV superfan discussion, After Buzz TV. And now, let the buzz begin. Hey. Hi, neighbor. Welcome to the Trump Report. Our cow, Shareable Texas, said our song should be Manic Monday by the Bangles, and obviously that's what I've chosen. Know the title of this episode and Justice for All, so I pulled the title track from the Metallica album of the same name. Uh, welcome to the Trump Report at a special early time, and we appreciate those of you who have joined us, and we appreciate our panel and our special guest. Uh, for those watching on YouTube, to my left, your right, Scott Moore at S Man 80. Hey guys. And Chelsea Galicia at Chelsea Galicia. Hello. And we have a very special in studio guest, Dr. Christopher Metzler. Your website, drchristophermetzler.com. On Twitter, at Dr. Christopher Metzler. You keep it all simple. Very I like simple. that. A lot of times people are like, the real or not the fake Dr. Christopher Metzler. That's too much. It's good, just good you. Branding. Yeah, good branding. Yeah, I appreciate it. And uh, 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 amongst your work is the book, The Construction and Rearticulation of Race in a Post-Racial America, which I hope I said correctly. You did. Okay, because I had all those words, and I was like, let me make sure I get them in the right order. Uh, anyway, uh, let's... Uh, Start off uh, by saying our, our thoughts are with everyone in New York, especially yes. those impacted mm -hmm. by you know yet another instance of uh, senseless violence. I'm from New York originally, and I was just there for a week and a half with my two-year-old son literally wandering around, not saying I was in the same spot, but it's just the idea that something so random like this can happen. It's, it's always uh, chilling to hear, and then, of course, the fact that it's kind of the new normal, that, oh, there was another thing, mm -hmm. we feel bad. And we, we don't dwell on it. And, uh, I, you know, I, I think we, we can for a little bit. We don't know a lot about this. And that's sort of, this happened fairly recently. You know, I was just having a, a business conversation because I'm important with someone <laughs> who <laughs> just found out that it happened. So it, it's it's not, you know, it happened earlier today, but it's still kind of I think seeping the, in. The latest mm -hmm. that we know is that there are eight people yes. that have passed yes. away and they've mm -hmm. revealed the name of the individual that they took into custody and it is a foreign name, sounding name. So, so uh, let the so, racism begin. So we know we we know what uh, certain outlets are focused on today. Uh, we, we'll focus on something else that uh, probably uh, I alluded to Christmas earlier at the top of the show. Maybe it felt like uh, the start of a of a long Christmas, or maybe a. Uh, a uh, legal Hanukkah season for uh, people who are not fans of President Trump. But uh, I want to start with uh, be, uh, staying on this for a moment. I wanted to kind of talk to Dr. Metzler. What is it about there just being so much of this? Is it is it just like, it doesn't mean we don't think it's terrible, but it's just too much for people to process at this point. Do you think that's accurate? Yeah, I think that's in fact accurate. And you know, it, it's too much for people to process, absolutely. And it doesn't help, to your point, uh, that we start off with this whole conversation of, I ah, told you, it was a Muslim. Um, that doesn't help either. And we also, the government doesn't help it by having these conversations, calling it terror, before we know what it is. So it is absolutely one of those things where it's a very scary time. And we're looking for some help. We're looking for a comforter in chief. Apparently, we're looking in the wrong place. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's a that's a fairly accurate assessment. And you know, just as bad as sort of on the other side, you have the people who are like, you hear about a terrible story, yeah. and there's sort of a, there's a little bit of relief where it's like, oh, look at that. It was a it was a you know it was a Timothy McVeigh type. Yes. It wasn't a foreign. You know, right. so it's like it helps that narrative. And so I think people all across the political spectrum are you know, guilty, really, of sort of using these things to kind of advance their story. And it's really, it's just, it's always terrible to hear. Uh, it just, you do hear it so often. And, yeah, absolutely. And 
that's uh, terrible. So anyway, our, our thoughts are with everyone there. Mm -hmm. But where I do want to start is a little bit uh, kind of the obvious place. Uh, we wanted to talk about uh, the aforementioned Manic Monday that our friend uh, Charitable Texas mentioned. Oh, and we have our friend Marissa in the booth, by the way. And uh, Marissa has been getting some shout outs on the show because uh, she's taken over making the thumbnails for the show. And as I mentioned, the intro song and the title for the episode comes from the Metallica album Injustice for All, which is an interesting piece of work with the Lady Justice. Mm -hmm. And there she is all tied up. And look what Marissa did with that. Put President Trump in there. So thank you, Marissa. And uh, when you have a moment, if you could put the chat up, because we're on at an earlier time, we understand that our usual friends might not be there. It's probably Storage Yard resident is all thrown off. <laughs> He's going to be watching this. It'll be an archive. And we'll look at the comments, and we'll share them next week. And that's like everyone's going to be jet lagged. They're like, whoa. What yeah, I know. It's like, right. it's yeah, not it's my like usual it's, time. I know. And, and <laughs> as I mentioned last week, it's simply because I need to take my my son out for trick or treating. That was because you're important. Uh, I, well, you're look, I am important, and if I say the show's at four o'clock, the show's at four o'clock. Uh, also, because I'm taking, the, you know, my boss. As important as I am, my boss is my son Felix, who uh, I'm dressed as Mr. Rogers because he's dressed as Daniel Tiger, just to keep the theme. Uh, I thought about not wearing the sweater uh, on the show, but then I also thought, well, why not? And I know we I need to move. I know we need Rogers. to move on to more important things. But, uh, Scott, you won your uh, office I did. Halloween. <laughs> we'll tweet this picture out. Who were you? This is so great what he was dressed up as. I was Dorothy Spornak from the Golden Girls. I made my whole team and dress up. And I can't believe you didn't dress up. I mean, you changed, I I changed. to come here. Yes. You changed to come here. So, Went back to civilian clothes. So uh, follow at SMan80, yes. and you have to yes. promise that you'll tweet out a picture. I will. At some I will. Point. And by the way, I noticed Shareable Texas is not there in the chat, but uh, Storage Yard Resident is in the chat, so uh, the time change, time difference did not affect him Some of our friends are there. I'm so impressed. Our Scott yeah. Brown, the Demon Knot. Yeah, every, people are good, wishing good. us happy Halloween, yes. and uh, we do hope that everybody has a, a happy Halloween. Yeah, uh, happy obviously. and safe one. Exactly. Thank you for adding that. So um, we're going to start with our uh, recovering lawyer, Chelsea Galicia. So you hear about... The indictments, and we'll kind of break down Manafort, Gates, and Papadopoulos, who's just some kid named George, uh, depending on. Or Webster's dad. We, yeah, there was actually that was actually a great meme that somebody created because that was Mr. Papadopoulos. Yeah, yeah George, George Papadopoulos. Car George Karras, the, the character. Yeah, so there was like a lot of memes of Webster. Chelsea, do you know who Webster is? Yes. Okay. Well, I had to ask. I know, yeah. So many times yes. I say stuff like that, you're like, I don't. Well, I don't she's know only you're... 21, so yeah, that's you know, also true. Also true. Plus. Thirteen years. <laughs> Why would you say that? What would you say? Yeah. Honesty. Well, so you know what? That's something that that's there's not you, enough of. That's why you're never going to make it in politics. <laughs> <laughs> also true. Uh, anyway, but Chelsea, uh, so we'll just sort of start uh, your reaction to first. There was kind of like over the weekend we started here, like oh, there's going to be something on Monday, mm -hmm. yeah. And then the actual indictments. Tell well, us, tell us, tell us what we should know and what you think. Well, about leading it. up to it, you know, of course, Drexel and I were going back and forth about who it's going to be and. I was wondering if there were bets going on in Vegas about oh. who was about to go down. Yeah, mm -hmm. if somebody knows the answer to that, and if I mean, a, mm -hmm. you can yes, like bet on who's going to win Dancing right. with the Stars and stuff. So I'd be surprised mm -hmm. if you couldn't. And like, what were the odds on Trump? You know, I mean, and I, I, I and I had an inkling it was Manafort. I mean, it's probably an obvious one. Yeah, so I mean, I, I'm going to guess that those were like five to two odds. You know, that's it, it, it's one of those things where it's like betting at the beginning of the football season that the Patriots are going to win the Super Bowl. The odds aren't going to be good because it's like pretty <laughs> decent chance it could happen. So, the, you know, the Manafort odds probably weren't great. But, I wasn't about, uh, to, you know, I wasn't honestly, about I, to get $18 million yeah, from getting that right, I, I, look, as Mr. Manafort I, has done. I probably would have put 100 bucks on Hillary because those odds were probably... <laughs> they're, 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 they're those are probably your best odds. Right? Yeah, yeah exactly. Because it's like, why not at this point? Yeah. Uh, anyway. Okay, so... Truth be told, I was a little disappointed because I was expecting more Russia connection. Mm -hmm. It seems so obvious, Mr. Pro-Ukraine, you know, lobbyist, and uh, I'm sorry, pro-Russia Ukrainian lobbyist. There could, should have been a connection because after all, the special counsel was assigned to look into collusion between the Trump campaign and Russia. But if a special counselor finds that there are crimes um, aside from specifically what he's out to look for, 
he's allowed to go after them too. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it's it's fair game what's happened to Mr. Manafort. Uh, most people that do what he does don't really get busted for it. Uh, his lawyer made a statement yesterday that he's only, Mr. Manfort's only one of six people that's ever been charged with this failure to uh, register as a foreign agent thing and only one person's been convicted because usually they say, hey, dude, you're not uh, registered and then people registered and call it a day. And uh, he just didn't, even though Actually, he did. He went in late, he but it was too way late. Later, yeah. But you know the fact that he had all these you know offshore accounts and these shell businesses that he was using to launder money into the United States with, which of course he didn't pay taxes on, and that's how they always go down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so you know he is going down for being a, you know a shady crook businessman. Will this then connect to Trump and Russia? I think so, and my premonition, actually I'm kind of borrowing this from somebody that said this to me, that this is the leverage that they use to get Paul Manafort to t start talking. Is to actually mm -hmm. indict him first. To and then lessen right. his punishment that makes sense. by you know, agreeing yeah. to talk. And, uh, uh, and then uh, his, the, well, I no, guess that's right. And so Dr. Metzler, uh, I wanted to sort of get some of your thoughts on all of this, but I wanted to kind of start off with the point with there are a lot of people that were kind of very excited. I jokingly said it's like Christmas morning for people, but what does that say about us that we're that excited to find corruption in our government? Is it just because it's this government that people feel so badly about or, I don't know, give us your thoughts. Yeah, well, I think it's a combination of this government and I, but I also think there is some spillover. A lot of ardent Trump supporters fundamentally believe that Hillary Clinton was just so corrupt, and this is the time now to let's just get something. And, and, and in, in fact, the president keeps tweeting out, well, why isn't Hillary indicted? Dude, that, that, that boat sold. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. Yeah, well, and, and, and this is coming from a conservative, right? You are, you yes. are a mm -hmm. loud and proud conservative. A absolutely. Trump mm -hmm. conservative, not Trump conservative. Not Trump conservative. Uh, because those, yeah, those, those are like finding a unicorn. Every yes, once in a while, exactly. you, do, you do find them. They I exist. Yes. Yeah. No, well, no, no, I appreciate you asking. Fundamentally, Trump's not a Republican right. or a conservative. Mm -hmm. And so from my standpoint, it is this kind of behavior. So what do we have? We have the whole thing. And, and as a matter of fact, in one of the shows, I heard one of the commentators saying, oh, well, you know, in the Clinton administration, uh, dude, Hillary is Does not, not have the yeah. president. An administration. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, even even Hillary, I, I don't know if she tweeted it or said, I think she said it at an event. She's like, apparently they're mistaken and they thought that I was the mm -hmm. president. Yeah. yeah. And they want me to be investigated for, you know, you well, know. yeah. Well, and I mean, look, that's what Trump has done so well, regardless of what you think of him, he's very good at the sleight of hand distraction. Mm -hmm. You know, bad Absolutely. things start to happen and then you call out the NFL players who mm -hmm. are kneeling. Oh, so, yeah. ex exactly. And that's the strategy. It's worked for him. So far. Um, so far. <laughs> so far. Exactly. For, so far, it's mm -hmm. worked for him. I think in this case, um, the special counsel is going about this case as a typical mob case. It's like he's taken down the mob or Rico, the racketeering kind of cases. I think that's the way that he's going about it, which I think is absolutely brilliant. You know, back in the day, I was uh, a prosecutor, and that's the kind of stuff that, you know, we would do. I mean, so for me, it's, I think it's, it's really, really good to be able to do that, because you really have to figure out where the bodies are buried. So you mm -hmm. think there's more to it? Oh, weird. I think mm -hmm. there's, yeah. I think this is the beginning. Mm -hmm. And I'm a little struck that the press secretary said yesterday, um, well, this is coming to a close. You well, I mean, that that's part of that same sort of, of approach hand, yeah. that it's like if you say something, mm -hmm. there's going to be at least some people are going to just assume it's true because mm -hmm. you said it. But who and believes the, that? Yeah, but I, yeah, I agree that I think that this this isn't the tip of the iceberg. This is yeah. like the tip of the, the tip, tip of the, of the, the, yeah, the exactly. tip. Yeah, exactly. Like this needle mm -hmm. on top of the iceberg that hit the Titanic. You and, know, and like, the, that's what this is. And and that's exactly mm -hmm. what or I guess the Titanic hit the iceberg. The iceberg was just doing what it was. You know, the iceberg was just being an iceberg. Yeah, it's all hanging out. Yeah, don't blame the iceberg. Scott, I wanted before we moved on. I wanted to sort of just get some overall thoughts. From no, you, I, I we'll, we'll dive into. I do each agree with diamonds. with both of of what you both said. Is that um, you know there was two prongs to it. There there were some people that said, "Well, is Mueller going to wait and try to do it 
all at once. But then, like what you were saying, it's sort of the methodically yeah. going about it, and what you were saying, Chelsea, about if he was going to go ahead and, and kind of meet the punishment now and say these are the charges, then maybe it would get Manafort and Gates and Papadopoulos <laughs> to start talking. <laughs> Some kid and, named George. And, and, George. and, and lessen the, <laughs> the, the charges for them to start talking about the other stuff. So I think, like you were saying, this is just the very, very beginning. And back to what you were saying too earlier about why we're so happy to see the government corrupt. I think it's more that we're so happy to see these people uh, be caught for what they were doing and not get away with it. Because for so long, we've been watching these people and feeling like, oh, if you're a rich, white, straight guy, you're going to get away with doing whatever you want. And um, you're above the law. And we've seen a lot of times where it seems like Trump feels like he's above the law. So we're kind of cheering the fact that these people are starting to be caught for what they did and they're not going to be able to get away with it, hopefully. so. Uh, there's a, a comment in the chat from the Demon Knot that would be echoed by our friend Stephen Helmkamp, who <laughs> sure hasn't been on in about a year, uh, that uh, Hillary Clinton needs to be investigated. Also, the Clinton Foundation needs to be investigated. Okay, wait. And it must be written in Invisible mm -hmm. Ink, but it should say ClintonCash.com there. I don't <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> what, what were you doing? I was going to say, okay, let's all investigate, but can we also then go back and investigate Dick Cheney and right. Rumsfeld and sure. all these right. clowns? I'm, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. not saying that no one should look at what Hillary Clinton, almost said Chelsea, what Hillary Clinton's been up to, <laughs> or Chelsea. Or Chelsea Clinton. You know, if, look, if there's something going on there, please. <laughs> <laughs> but that doesn't mean, you know, President Trump is like, oh, you know, don't, hey, don't worry about us. Worry about Hillary. Look, if there's something with Hillary, yeah, definitely look into oh, it. I'm not saying that. How long but, have we been investigating Hillary Clinton yeah. and Bill Clinton? They have not the found thing, anything guys, for the past 25 here's years. Here's the thing. They've Most tried. Americans well, have Foster. not known yeah. that any part of the government was corrupt. They were completely mm -hmm. naive to this. And then they got this idea that Hillary was, and there's all these stories mm -hmm. about me. And uh, the uranium thing, which is another interesting mm -hmm. thing that uh, Joy Reid nicely slammed down the she other day. Did. It was great. But this is the first time that Americans are getting the idea that there's like real life corruption in our government. The thing that they don't know is it didn't start with the Clintons. Oh, no. right. right now, um, my boyfriend and I have spent like the last, I don't know how long, week watching Oliver Stone's history, people's history of the United States. Watch that and you will see that corruption did not enter the scene in the election of 2016. Mm -hmm. I mean, it has been going on for a very long time. So, so sorry, all these the guy, people. The guy who made JFK did something about history? Uh, I might I might take a pass on that, but you go. I mean, Actually, I'll watch Ken look Burns at, or somebody else. It but. has been rated as very accurate. All right, I'm just I'm surprised. That's but, that's all. But I'm the saying. point is, it's deeply entrenched yeah. and it has been. And for so when years when I years hear people say, yell Clinton, 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 not yeah. only do I think that's just obnoxious and basically irrelevant, but that they have no idea of American history. And it just points out to me their ignorance. Well, and it's a, it's a false. With all due respect. Yeah, it, it's a false choice because it's like, okay, let's not investigate Trump, but let's investigate Clinton. Okay, if you want to investigate, okay. But, the, you know, this investigation has gone on and on. I am, from a conservative standpoint, trying to figure out since when, as conservatives, we like to spend money on endless investigations. I'm baffled by that. Nobody can answer that question for me. But if you want to keep going on, you know, it, it, it's How about it's hypocritical. investigations that cost money, but that maybe the government can Could, exactly, get, you right. know, from these, you know, military contracts and things like that that are certainly corrupt and people like from the Bush administration that made a whole lot of money from them, that kind of stuff. Right. Down, the, that, uh, that kind of investigation yeah. is cool? All right, yeah. glad. I mean, mm -hmm. look at a conservative look at guy. A, I a agree. bipartisan <laughs> agreement right here. Yeah. Yeah. Look, you know, there have been a few occasions mm -hmm. in the last few months where you've agreed with storage yard residents. So you see, mm -hmm. people are coming together, and, and that's what we need <laughs> in Unity. times like this. That's happening right, right here. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Well, uh, let's uh, talk a little bit about bachelor number one, Paul Manafort. Uh, you know, he's in a very, uh, very storied career with, uh, you know, he, he's not just some guy named Paul. Uh, he rounded up delegates for Gerald Ford at the 1976 Republican Convention. He helped manage Ronald Reagan's convention efforts in 1980. So he's been around for a little while. But that's not the part that anybody's that interested in. But I, okay, so I was interested. But uh, <laughs> he was an advisor to UK, U, the Ukraine's pro-Russia party of regions, was what the name of it was. Uh, he helped the party turn its reputation around as corrupt, and under Russian influence. How so funny. Good, yeah, so it, it seems like there's a blueprint for, you know, the way he might operate. And, uh, you know, look, obviously he, he was ousted from the campaign uh, fairly, well, not fairly early on, but uh, long before Election Day. But at the same time, 
the idea that this guy very clear ties mm -hmm. to the Ukraine and to Russia. You know, yeah, there there's definitely something there. And the idea that he didn't was just like, why are you saying that? Mm -hmm. Because it's it's sort of obvious, isn't it? I mean, that's like the you know, I, I I have like crumbs and chocolate on my face and the cookie jar is empty and I'm like, No, no, it was fine. <laughs> <laughs> um so Which it probably would have been me that would be honest. <laughs> so that's not a good example. I, I would have eaten most of them. But anyway, yeah, it's a really good point. But uh I don't know, Doctor Metzler, I mean, you hear about this guy and you know, it also seems like like President Trump, probably not that much of a conservative. No, and and I mean Paul Manafort has always been about Paul Manafort. I mean, this is not a surprise. What What's interesting to me is this conversation about he played a minor role. You don't play a minor role in a campaign mm -hmm. when you are the delegate yeah. whip. It just doesn't work that way. So uh, for me, you know, when we're going through this whole conversation, people knew he was corrupt. That was not a surprise. Yet he was in that position. And now you're trying to dismiss it as, oh, he just played a minor role. Yeah, right. Or that happened so long ago that right. it doesn't count. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what? but yeah. you're corrupt or you're not. Right. <laughs> you know, there's you're no still statute the of limitation. Manager. You still were actively involved in the Trump campaign. You still had corruption, regardless of if this was 20 years ago or whatever, he's still not a good person and he was running his Trump's campaign. Yeah. Right. Then so the specifics are, it, it was only August of last yeah. year that uh, he was ousted because mm -hmm. there were the revelations of mm -hmm. large payments that were listed in an alleged black book of under the table payments by the ousted Ukrainian government. So obviously you don't get fired for something like that because mm -hmm. there's nothing there. You know, I mean, it's just like, okay, this is, this is a bad situation. Mm -hmm. We need to get rid of this guy. Um, was there like a day before CNN hired him? I guess we don't have to, <laughs> I guess we, do we need to look into them? You know, but, and, and he was integral in, in the Mike Pence selection. I mean, yeah. he had so much involvement no, in the and Trump to, campaign. To the, to the point Dr. Metzler made about like the person in charge of the delegate, like <laughs> it, it's easy to remember, or it's easy to forget, I guess, mm -hmm. that, you know, there was some concern about the delegates like would mm -hmm. they actually go and vote for Trump or were they worried about it you know and would would that you know because there were there's like oh maybe, maybe John Kasich is going to get some which obviously was never going to happen mm -hmm. but there was a lot of talk about it so there that was a that was definitely a full-time project to make sure that the delegates were in line yeah I mean I was on the floor in Cleveland and I mean that was the big conversation how, where are we relative to the delegates? Who do we have to get into shape? Yeah. All of those kinds of things. So to to dismiss this as oh well, you know, he didn't do He's that much. He's a hanger much. on. Yeah, a and coffee yeah. boy. Yeah, he <laughs> <laughs> just got the coffee. Um, you know, that's 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 what you have. Yeah, uh, and uh, let's see what the, what the the chat thinks. Uh, Snow Wolf, I think that's somebody new. Yeah. Uh, Trump does not know how and what to do as a president. Trump has done nothing for the United States. Why do people vote for him? Uh, well, because maybe they thought he would do something for the mm -hmm. United States. And I mean, unfortunately, look, they, he is doing stuff. It's just not uh, like well, in front of our faces. And he talks about EPA, he talks about doing stuff. He's doing stuff, but like destroy the EPA okay. and not you know turn over you know uh, destroy regulations that we all need and things like that. So he's doing stuff. He's harming us, sure enough. Well, he's not he's really harming our, our reputation as well by the way he behaves and the way he acts and the, and the way the allies and sure. people around the world now think of us um, which is not a good thing either and how he handles uh, foreign policy and everything else. It's just, it's, it's dangerous and uh, I feel like, Chelsea, you want to read the next well, comment from well, the demon Well, because he says, because most people didn't want to vote for Clinton, which is the most beautiful segue. All right, go ahead. <laughs> Mention your poll. <laughs> I, I want to get, get back to Bachelor number two and Bachelor number three, but I'll let you, let's see, what time uh, is it? All right, I'll give you I'll give you three minutes to talk wow, about that's it. Wow, that's really generous. Yeah. Well, well, three no, minutes. You get to mention it, and then we can comment. Yes, gotcha. right. Three minutes on this topic. Yes, okay, so. So the reason it's a beautiful segue is because uh, there's a poll that came out. According to a Trump pollster, Bernie Sanders would have won if he had gone up against Donald Trump. I'm going to leave that there. And do not <laughs> can say whether or not he would have voted for Bernie. Well, look, here's the thing about Bernie. I think at the time it didn't seem like, you know, it seemed like 
almost anyone could get elected against Trump, which obviously that was clearly not the case uh, because Hillary couldn't. But yeah, he was not a divisive person. I mean, you definitely had conservatives had huge problems with someone like Bernie Sanders, but there wasn't all the baggage. He he's not crooked Bernie. You could you could have tried that. He probably would have called him. I don't know, sleepy Bernie because he's old or uh, old Bernie. You know, I mean, I, I don't even know how much older than Trump he is. He is. Trump. He's like, he's like, they're about yeah. the same age. But he's, it doesn't matter. You know, yeah. it, it wouldn't have stopped him. Uh, Dr. Metzler, you hear of, of some polling like that. Do you think that Bernie connected with people in a way that Hillary just wasn't able to? I, I, absolutely. And I mean, it, it was a bit of a surprise to me that he was able to do that. But there was a genuine connection. Part of the, a large part of the problem with Hillary Clinton, from my standpoint, was her campaign, her campaign, her campaign team, um, and the fact that they had gotten very comfortable in believing that you know Trump just would Couldn't not be possibly elected, win. and that's 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 a whole a lot of what mm -hmm. ended up happening. And so as a result of that, then you know they're just kind of running around and and <laughs> these attacks. Look. Her campaign manager never, Robbie Mook should never have been the, the campaign manager. And the reason I say that is when you are campaigning um, and you are going to get into a dog fight, you get someone who can fight a dog, not someone who's trying to fight a cat. Hmm. And yeah. that's the problem that's that you point. had. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, if you think about it, I mean, that's Robbie Mook is the person I always point to because he was like, nah, we don't need to go to Wisconsin. Yeah. I think I think well, Bernie would have gone to Wisconsin. Oh, he would have. Somebody like James Carville, I know he's out of the game, but somebody like that, he would have gone to Wisconsin. He's like, fun. no, we have to go. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, um, you know, it, it's a tough one because. On one hand, I, I agree that Hillary's a terrible campaigner. I think she's a, she would have been a great president because she's good at the details and the wonkiness of knowing basically what's going on. And, and she had the experience being Secretary of State and Senator, which Trump did not. And I think she's always been a terrible campaigner. And that was part of the problem is that yeah. she wasn't connecting to people. Um, it's just so hard to say with a theoretical, just like polls now talking about Trump up against 2020 people. and. It's hard because it's it's saying so many different variables and something that's theoretical that we can never prove that Bernie would have won against Trump, even though I think there could have been a chance, but it's so theoretical. It's like saying, well, if the Comey letter didn't come out, would Hillary have won? If she yeah. went to Wisconsin two more times, she would have won. I mean, there it, it makes it really difficult or what was happening. I mean, we had so many issues with the fact that there was a lot of baggage that Hillary brought to it, obviously. I mean, the, biggest, of piece of, the that, biggest piece of baggage that she brought is Bill. You well, know? that's yeah. part of so it. so much to do with but it. But them and their scandals and yeah. the email, all that stuck. And the fact was, she's not a good campaigner. Then you had a lot of people that didn't like Trump, but hated Hillary so much they would vote for Trump instead of Hillary. Then you had the Democrats that weren't feeling eager to vote because they thought, again, that Hillary had it in the bag. And they weren't feeling motivated like they did with Obama to really go out and be passionate. And they thought, oh, she's going to win. And they were comfortable after eight years with Obama. So you had a lot of different factors that were going on that kind of worked against her. Um, that I, I wonder if that would have been similar if a Bernie or another Democrat was in there. It, it's hard to it's just hard to say. Well, but it's it's a great yeah it's, it's a great poll, but it's just very theoretical. Yeah, it's it it is in fact very th theoretical. The problem, you know, for her was when you look at the poll numbers, when you start to see. Uh, people coming out to vote from rural Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. from rural Wisconsin, they're not coming out to vote mm -hmm. for you, Hillary. No. So at no. that point, it's like, okay, what's the strategy? How do right. we move forward there? And then when you say, okay, Cole's dead, you don't wait a couple of weeks to apologize right. for that. I yeah. mean, so it's it's those kinds right. of missteps that and, and just doomed her. And they took advantage and I and I do agree I don't think Bernie would have taken advantage of the blue wall yeah. Pennsylvania Wisconsin and Michigan yeah and they just assumed they're gonna win it because they had not lost since 1988 so they yeah. went in thinking that they had this I, and, I, and I, I think, think Bernie would have I definitely future, campaigned heavily I, on, there. on both sides I think future campaigns should have volunteers that just ask hey can you drive around your neighborhoods and, and just sort of film what the what the signs are in the front yards because you talk to people who mm -hmm. traveled at that time there were Trump signs everywhere, everywhere. in places like Pennsylvania yeah. Wisconsin mm -hmm. Florida mm -hmm. uh, you know yeah. that I personally heard from a lot of people it's like yeah they're everywhere I don't see any Hillary signs uh, storage yard resident you'll be glad to hear this. I don't know if you saw it in the chat. He says, I'll say it again. 
Bernie was a superior candidate to Hillary. So you see, once mm-hmm. again, you and storage yard resident and uh, bipartisan agreement again. And by the way, I <laughs> twice uh, in one night. <laughs> I misattributed to shareable Texas the suggestion for Manic Monday. That was our friend R. Scott Brown, not Senator Scott Brown, as we always point out, just R. Scott Brown. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, Dr. Betts, we want to talk to you uh, about a few specific topics that sure. relate to your work and your book. I just want to sort of touch on Rick Gates who was Manafort's deputy. So mm-hmm. it makes sense that he's going to get dragged mm-hmm. up into this. Yeah. Uh, Chelsea, your mm-hmm. thoughts first on Mr. Gates. I mean, I mean, it's just like a little classic mini-me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> You're right. So he's the Vern Troyer of this? I was Absolutely. Just, I was just excited. That's probably the, the best way to look at it. And poor guy was only able to funnel in, like, maybe th- $3 million, as opposed yeah. to Manafort's yeah. eighteen. What? Yeah. I mean, I mean how, how, it's terrible. I can't believe million. you didn't get fired. Amateur hour. I know. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously, my God. Uh, or <laughs> what Hillary charges for one speech. Uh, but uh, Dr. Metzler, just sex, uh, it just seems to make sense that, you know, this is somebody, Gates is somebody that, uh, you know, I, I like that Hillary referred to him as mini-me. But it's like, yeah, look, you work that closely with this guy, you're getting dragged mm-hmm. in too. And if I think this is a guy who'd be easier to flip. If he knows something, he's going to talk before Manafort mm-hmm. does. You know, oh, Manafort, absolutely. probably working with Russians like he does, he probably knows the importance of uh, silence. Yeah, but this guy's right. like, I'm not going to jail for this guy. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. And I think you're absolutely right, because whatever Manafort knows, Gates knows. There's no question about that. They have all, the, the two of them have worked closely in circles together for years. Um, so, yeah, I think he's easier to flip than uh, Manafort would be. Uh, and uh, Scott, I'll start with you for some guy named George, George Papadopoulos, <laughs> who was named by the Trump campaign in March 2016 as one of eight foreign policy advisors. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't sound like something you just give to some right. kid named George. Uh, and the Washington Post previously reported he had tried to facilitate contact between Russian government entities and the Trump campaign. Whoops. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, give us your thoughts about some kid named George and well, uh, why you think Trump is so quick to tamp down the idea that this guy was important. Well, this guy in particular. Well, of course. I mean, he was trying to say, oh, this is a low level staffer. Yeah. And yet he's on record, uh, you know, last year when they were putting this foreign policy team together, saying him by name and talking about how great he is and they're a great team. Um, it's just like everything else like we were talking about earlier. It's just a way to distract. And if you say that, He's not a big deal. You'll have 38 to 40 percent of the public believing it. So, um, and that's why Sarah Huckabee Sanders went out there and, and said all the uh, lies uh, at the press conference yesterday. Because again, 38 to 40 percent of people are just going to believe it off the bat if you say it. So, do, do you think yesterday, regardless of what he thought in the last few weeks or months before this, but do you think yesterday was a day where Sean Spicer was like, oh, "I'm so ready." <laughs> <laughs> it was like, I actually thought about that guy. I, I was thinking about it too, but I think every single day. Yeah, but that one in gone, particular, you know, I think like, he's I very have happy. to work so hard. <laughs> you know, I, I, Melissa McCarthy would have been on SNL. You know, it's like it's great. It's just like whatever he's doing right now, yeah. he has to be uh, happier. Yes, a uh, hundred. Uh, Ten percent happier. Uh, Dr. Metzler, you hear about somebody like George Papadopoulos being a some kid named George. Mm-hmm. Uh, that should be something of a red flag that there's a lot more to this guy that yeah. the president seems to want people well, to think. Well, absolutely. Not only was he announced as a member of this foreign policy mm-hmm. team, he has no foreign policy experience well, to speak of. <laughs> exactly. So that's number one. And then you say, oh, just some guy named George. And then some guy named George doesn't sit in the cabinet room at the table with the president and others. Are you kidding me? You know, and he's sending emails to senior staff members. He's not just some guy mm-hmm. named George. I mean, that, that, and again, that's a major problem I have with this administration, is they keep going out here with just saying random things. And it must be something about standing behind the podium that causes someone to lie. Um, I know. <laughs> you know, because, I mean, it's, so first there was Sean, who was not in the bushes, but amongst the bushes, <laughs> and now there's Sarah. And I'm like, Sarah, really? Did you just, it, and it, it, it's just unbelievable to me. And John Kelly. Yeah, I'm well, like, what John, has happened to John Kelly? Well, and for me. I, thought, I had so much hope for I him. I think he was the Ivanka uh, Trump. <laughs> I know, I had so we much hope for so him. We expected so much more than we should have. Uh, well, so and, disappointed. And, and, and for me, it's like, you are the chief of staff. Yeah. Generally, we don't even know who the chief of staff is. 
why are you talking? Be quiet and run the operation. Baffling. Behind the scenes, yeah. Well, uh, let's uh, move it along to uh, our guest, Dr. Christopher Metzler, whom, as I mentioned, drchristophermetzler.com, and he's on Twitter, at drchristophermetzler. Uh, this isn't. This is just amongst your books, but uh, the author. You're the author of the construction and rearticulation of race in a post-racial America. So that's the most recent book. So that's yeah. Okay, I wanted to make sure I, I wasn't plugging a book from. Well, know, yeah. There's the the other one called Two Americas um, of Anger is coming up. That's the. Next oh, so that's one. that's pending. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's it's interesting you mention that because that's actually where I wanted to start. Um, yeah. Amongst the the notes that I was sent. Uh, preparing for this was talk a little bit about the importance of unifying the country or at least trying to unify the country as opposed to kind of destroying it with this political climate and it's very easy to point at the Trump supporters but it's everybody I yeah. would say both sides are just as guilty of just this really toxic environment oh, we have absolutely I think you know both sides are in fact responsible for it uh, and and let's just start with network news for example if we look at network news, unless you are either a flaming Republican or flaming uh, Democrat, you're not going to be booked on air to have a conversation because it's turned into reality TV. I think that's number one. Number two, if you look at places like Facebook, Twitter, etc., what you have is all this vitriol that's being spread because people just aren't reading. They just mm -hmm. have no sense. They'll say something, well, you know, or they'll post a GIF or a meme. And it's like, you know, how about using some brain power? Yeah, and, right. and to I the agree. point that we're getting it from both sides. Yeah. I have, I'm friends with a lot of people on the left, a lot of people on the right, some on the very far mm -hmm. right, yeah. and some on the very far left. And you just see it all the time, people sharing articles. And like, I don't even think they read it. I think they no. read the headline and mm -hmm. they're like, this is, this is my political activism for the day. I had share. <laughs> yeah. and, and it's like, but they didn't even read it. And just think about the sources, you know? I mean, it's very easy for people on the left to be like, oh, that came from Breitbart. But then you share something from something called Occupy Democrats. Exactly. So I don't know that that's, you know, it's any that. more valuable. So, and it's hard. Look, if you want to be informed, it's actually very hard to find objective news. Correct. There are yeah. some people that feel like, well, just read some foreign press. But then, you know, you, you, yeah, if you, you, read, have, you run into yeah. so many problems. So yeah. it, it's difficult uh, to do all of that. But I, I definitely agree that it would be great to have some kind of uh, unity in the country. I, I don't know how we get there when, at this when point. When were we, like, I mean, unified here's the thing. to the degree so that you people would, want You would think we were so far apart during the uh, George W. Bush administration. Mm -hmm. You would think we were so far apart during the Reagan years. And just by comparison, it's like, oh, no, that's like, oh, there's like a, there's like a little, there's like a little, like, a little valley between us. Well, but now it's like the Grand Canyon's between people. Are we saying people. that because there was no social media back Possibly. then? So mm -hmm. we couldn't see people's true feelings? Well, I think back then, especially, you know, during the, the 80s, I mean, I, I was a kid, but I remember it was one of those things, you know, you, you don't talk about religion or politics. Now people don't really talk about religion, but they sure do want to talk about politics. It's almost like if you bring up something that's not politics, it's like, no, I, I, yeah, well, it's like, oh, have you been watching the World Series? Yeah, but how yeah. about Trump? I'm like, I, I don't really I'm, want to I'm talk about I'm a little, that. this is what I don't understand. This whole, like, let's unify. But this is a whole bunch Look. of Baloney. Oh, How, thank you for cleaning it up. <laughs> if we want, I think that if we want to unify, we're going to have to clean up the corruption on both sides. I think that is unifying. Chelsea, are both you suggesting sides. that we drain the swamp? <laughs> I think that's like the third time I've done that to you, but uh, you, you did. You did pose and, the question. and getting because money out of the, the uh, money out of politics. And that money out of right. politics is going to make a huge difference. Because yeah. the way to unify. I mean, anybody, siblings that are fighting, people that are fighting, is not to say, now you must understand him and he mm -hmm. must understand no, that, you. No, no. No. What you do is you find a common enemy. Yeah. And then together, they end up realizing that each of the other is human when yeah. they're working with and them. And there's more to in fight common, the common with them enemy. than there's the differences. Yes. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Let's do. I mean, let's pick a let's pick a cause, people. My favorite is getting money out of politics. I think everyone yeah. can agree that it's yes. really it's, corrupting. I thought, I thought yours dangerous. was death to the fast food industry. I thought that's what you. And wanted. that would happen <laughs> <Okay>. if <laughs> there was less money in politics. Okay, I just wanted okay. to make sure. Well, I well yeah, I, I I agree with you on that. I think getting money out of politics and term limits. I mean, the term, the, yes. the term, term limits, limits thing yes. to me 
is absolutely ridiculous because people are like, oh, well, throw the bums out, just not my bum. Right. Yeah, it's <laughs> everyone else. Yeah, it's everyone else. So everybody people. else. And, and then you have these people who have made careers of being there. And to the point of money and politics, when they leave, then they go to this big front. And, and oh, that's yes. the, the thing. Revolving, revolving door. door. Right. Mm-hmm. Yes, and, there was another uh, can, um, uh, candidate for, gosh, I can't remember. Oh, um, oh Jesus. It was the, a, the HUD, the F, come on, uh, Federal Housing, FHA. This, um, this, this Trump named some guy, help me out here. I'm, and he... <laughs> Maybe somebody in the chat can, because I'm not yeah. quite well, sure. He was running about a oh, he was running a, pr- a program related to federal housing. Okay. And then went out a couple of years later and helped those organizations pay the government back the least amount they possibly mm-hmm. could. And now he's being nominated to run the whole. Uh, God, I'm really. Well, I let's, I get, let's get back was, to. Let's get back to term limits because it is one of those things the that revol- and, but, there, there are people who do great work and honestly, if there were term limits, Bernie Sanders wouldn't be in the Senate anymore. And, and there, I don't think you have a problem with right, that. And there, yeah, are people, was, there are people change. who have done good work for their party. Look, I, people who watch the show know that for years I produced Dennis Miller's uh, radio talk show. Somebody we would have on all the time was a congressman, fr- a Republican congressman from California, uh, this guy named David Dreyer. Mm-hmm. He was a great guy. He was a good guest. He'd been a congressman from California for 30 years. And you're just like, I feel like that's too long. It's like well, the yeah. same you thing know? with Dana Rohrbacher. Yeah. Right. Well, then you think about, you know, Diane Feinstein. You think about people who have been there yeah. for a really long time and are in their 80s and 90, and you think, okay, it's time to turn it over to a new generation. And I also think if you're doing term limits, you should also change the Congress of having to run every two years because that's – now you're in constant campaign mode. Yeah, you can't I, get anything done. I, I think, Nobody wants to I think if the terms, four, keep if the terms were six, longer – and that would help keep I, I, some yeah, of the I don't perpetual know. campaigning out of it, too. Just out of nowhere, I would say somewhere around 15 years at most, for sure. <laughs> Maybe 10. But you want to give them enough time to get stuff done yeah. I would say, in a place you know, where it takes a long time. Three terms so for a senator, if, that's if 18 If you only years, give people two terms, time. you know, that like is, you can you can yeah. have two terms for a mayor of even a big city. That makes sense. Yeah, but for something like that, it, it seems like you have to have a reasonable term. Yeah, I, yeah. I, 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 I think you do. But, uh, you know, you also have to look at these people who have just been in there they are going nowhere they're part mm-hmm. of the problem mm-hmm. relative to Washington this whole conversation yeah and mm-hmm. that's the thing and 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 you know I, I hear all this conversation about draining the swamp what's happened in Washington is uh, the swamp is not being drained new alligators are being brought in right. <laughs> I mean it's the same thing yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and that's that, alligator that's what's mating happening. season is yeah. It? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and you know what it's like if there's not enough alligators then you build some robot alligators yeah. maybe you'll bring yeah. in some crocodiles exactly. you know, you're going to put something in there um, because we were talking about oh go ahead oh, no, I was going to say quickly too just finishing that thought about what you were talking about earlier you know versing today we are so divided because everyone can live in that bubble with their social yeah. media they don't have to read they can have an echo chamber with them, and you didn't have that in the 80s. And I'd also say the 80s were really the last time that we had a landslide election for president. Yeah. Ever since then, the gap has narrowed and narrowed and narrowed, and we've never seen an actual landslide type election like you had for Reagan in two terms, and that you had for even you know George H. W. Bush for all intents and purposes. You don't really have that anymore either because we are so divided, and you can express your opinion a lot easier now than you could 30 years ago. Um, where people weren't going to necessarily hear you and you just maybe hung out with people that were like-minded but you couldn't just post something that's going to go viral and millions of people are going to see it. So it is very different type of time period now than you had uh, in the past 25, 30 poor, years. That will... Poor, poor Wally Mondale. Now, what I wanted to... Uh, <laughs> uh, Dr. Metzler, uh, just moving on, we were sort of talking about the sourcing for people's inter- information. Uh, one of the great points you make is uh, President Trump is so vocal... Well, vocal is a bad term, but he's so prolific <laughs> on Twitter. Talk about how that affects information relations, because a lot of people figure, I'm going to follow the president, he's going to say something, I have a reasonable expectation that I'm getting good information from the president. That's wrong. Yes. I mean, it's, it's just absolutely wrong. But that goes back to the identity politics that we find ourselves in. Look, the fact of the matter is what the president, and not just this president, but any president who would use Twitter as prolifically as uh, he does, is they're getting their spin out. And unfortunately, people are believing that spin to be true. What they're saying is, he is the president of the United States. He knows of which he speaks. Uh, well, 
that's <laughs> open to discussion. <laughs> um, but in, in, in any event, that's, that's part of the problem. It changes the conversation. So when you have the problem, they're like, yeah, I'm with Trump all the way. Then my conversation often then is, okay, so on the issue of taxes, why are you with Trump on the issue of taxes? Because he's going to reduce my taxes. Well, it's not quite that mm -hmm. simple. Or true. <laughs> or true. <laughs> true. <laughs> uh, well, that actually brings up another point of yours. Uh, talk about when a tax cut is actually not a tax cut. <laughs> so what you have, and, and from what I've seen, and, and you know, the president said, well, people haven't really seen the bill, but yeah, it's okay. It's a work in progress. It's a work in mm -hmm. progress. It, when what you're simply doing is either triple down economics or shifting the burden, it's not a tax cut. I mean, essentially what you're having is, and, and this is probably where it's going to end up, you're going to end up with the top people continuing to get the biggest tax break. Period. Okay, so am I hearing that a conservative doesn't necessarily <laughs> believe in the trickle down theory? Is that what I hear yeah. from you? So you don't believe in it? No. Wow, what makes you a conservative? <laughs> <laughs> Great question. In reality. <laughs> reality. Wait, I, I mean, tell from, me. from my standpoint, when you're talking about this uh, triple down economics, here's the problem with that. The problem with that is a rising tide does not necessarily lift all boats. I don't care what anybody says about that, it's simply not true. Let's look at how people actually live and how they experience life. That's very different than this whole notion of, well, you know, eventually it'll trickle down. When has it? It's not well, worked. And, and there's Never. there's a line that I've used before on this show, and I'll always attribute that I'm stealing it from Bill Maher, but it, when speaking about trickle-down economics, he says, they're literally saying that we're pissing on you. The people at the top are peeing on the people down below. And how is that going to work exactly? Can I tell exactly? you something? My mom has this. My mom is an accountant, and she goes, yeah, like, if you, I can't believe she says this, and now I'm going to repeat it. She says, if you pee in your pants, <laughs> where does most of the pee stay? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> at the top. Yeah. Some yeah, of it's, it's, a, it's a great point. But it's true, because when you think about water draining down in the soil, and you think, okay, most of it's going to collect at the top, and then as it goes further and deeper down in the soil, less and less gets down there till finally nothing gets below. And that's exactly how it works. Like, it's going to start at the top and most of the people at the top are going to get most of the benefits, and then it gets less and less as it goes down. The real question is, when can we get your mom on the show? <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to have her as, as a guest. Um, uh, Dr. Metzler, talk a little bit about, we're talking about the divide between the left and the right. We'll talk about the fact that you yourself, as a conservative, I alluded to it earlier, I made a joke about it, conservatives and Trump supporters are definitely not one and the same, and they're actually pretty far apart. Yes. I, I, ha I know a few people that used to do some writing and some talking heads work, and then when Trump won, they're like, oh, no, 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 I'm out. I was gonna, I they were ready to bang the drum against Hillary once she became president. They're like, I can't speak up in favor of Trump because that they're just not interested in that. Yeah, well, I mean, initially, um, I spent a fair amount of time defending the president. Initially, I did. Um, because Why? Well, well, the Republican won. I mean, there's something, yeah. you know, I can yeah, understand so that to some extent. We sure. were pretty happy about that. Um, so there was that, but then it just kind of all went south. Wait, when did it change for you? Well, it changed for me. January 20th. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, at 12.01 p.m. Eastern. <laughs> well, it changed for me particularly when he got out there on Twitter and s kept these games going and attacking people personally. I'm like, you know what? We yeah, need to get the mm -hmm. people's business done. That's why you're in Did the you office. Did you believe that he was interested in doing that when he was campaigning? I thought he was. I actually thought that he was interested in doing what that. What about his history gave you the belief that he was he cared about the common man? Because he's a chameleon. Um, <laughs> like, you know, Dr. Metzler, you're far from the only person that thought that. Mm -hmm. they, what he was saying, you, people got the impression that's, like he's I mean, going to shake it up. That's he's why an won. outsider. Right. We like this. We hate Hillary, mm -hmm. but we also like that this guy is, is you know, I mean, he's this not. Is, this is my efforts at, at unifying, is to try and understand. understand. Yeah. Right, me too. Well, I'd, I'd because, know. Like, I, I, you know, for me, when I looked at Washington, and I've worked in Washington for a mm -hmm. number of years, I saw that nothing was getting done. So my thought was, okay, so he's going to bring in this cabinet. Here are some of the people who are going to come in, 
and here are the things that they're going to do. But then slowly what we started seeing is people saying, uh, you know what, I'm not going to join the cabinet. I'm good. Um, you know, and then I was like, okay. So maybe we have been <laughs> led astray here. So, so and, and that become, you know, that became the issue. I mean, and in a lot of respects from the party, there are a number of people in the party who have just ostracized me, which is fine. I don't really care because I'm not trying to get a position in Washington or anything like that. For me, the issue becomes the country. I am more concerned about the country and less concerned about the party whatever there's left of the party at this <laughs> point. Um, but that's that's pretty much where I am on that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, we only have a few more minutes, so uh, one of the things I did want to move on to is, a as a conservative, where do you hope we would be able to get to in terms of some kind of compromise on health care? It seems like Trump in particular can't get anything done, and the Republican the margin's just too slim for them to actually be able to, you know, once th two or three people are out, it's just not happening. Well, I think, so So for me, I never was a fan of the Obamacare piece, particularly since I run a number of medical companies, and I saw what was happening with HMOs and other insurances. What, that they were taking advantage? Yeah, big time. Mm -hmm. So my view was, uh, at, at, and still is, look at what works with the Obamacare stuff and let's get that done. We're not going to get there, and we're not going to get there in large part because the name Obama is attached to it. And see, for me, that's a problem. The problem, the, the issue really should be how do we fix health care? I never thought initially that government should be in the business of health care, but it doesn't matter. Government's in the business of health care. So how do we make that work? Right, exactly. Single payer. Obvious, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're no. getting so close. We thought no. maybe we could convince them. No. All right, so then, but so then in actuality, how do we make that work? <laughs> yeah, I think the way that we uh, we make that work is the states are going to have to pay uh, play rather a bigger role in health care. We cannot have a national health care plan without enough emphasis on what the states can do and how the states can do it. I think the national plan, anything that's done at the national level, is simply too cumbersome, comes with too many regulations, and is not. If you look at rural parts of the state, for example, health care is terrible. Is Really fast, is health care an area that we should let the markets reign free? No, I don't think absolutely free because that's pretty much what we've got at this point. Okay, so there should be regulations. There has we got to a be. A conservative saying there has to regulations. Be. All right, my day is just like <laughs> getting better. No, better. Well, there has to be now. regulations. Like, you, 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 you can't so, just. So that's the thing: is the regulations on the insurance companies? It's the hospitals. Yeah. Um, you, you, you right. have just to this, have regulations. And, and I would also add, though, I feel, and I feel that you would agree too, that there's got to be some basis for those regulations yeah. federally that all states have to abide by because a I feel like you can't just you give it to the states. All states can decide what's best for no. them because you'll get some states will say we don't want pre-existing conditions here because we no. want the base bare bones. So I feel like yes, I agree with you that states should be able to have more of a say for their individual residents, but there should be some baseline that, has that to be. federally has to start there and say these are a certain number of things that have to be included in these insurance plans pre-existing conditions, X, Y, and Z, certain things that have to be met, don't get right. to make the rules. Right. Well, yeah. And, yeah, and yeah. what can be applied, sure. and then from each state to be able to make We'll let perhaps. you uh, give one final thought on that. Dr. Yeah, Master. because the thing about it is if you don't do that, we will still end up paying for it through the emergency rooms mm -hmm. and then through, through having to bail insurance companies, hospitals out. We, we, that that mm -hmm. makes no sense. So we have right. to look at it up front rather than on the back end. Mm -hmm. You thought the GM bailout and all the auto industry bailouts were bad? Wait till you see what will happen with the hospitals. Well, mm -hmm. uh, obviously, Dr. Metzler, we'd uh, love to continue the conversation, and so hopefully next to. time you're back in town. <laughs> but as I was going to point out, those of you who want to tune in to The Political Beat a little bit, actually right about an hour from right now, mm -hmm. uh, also on AfterBuzz, check it out because our friend Drexel and Chelsea will be with Dr. Metzler in there. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us, though. Thank uh, you. DrChristopherMetzler.com, on Twitter at DrChristopherMetzler, and the 
book, The Construction and Rearticulation of Race in a Post-Racial America. I can't wait to find out when we got to post-racial America. No, it's, it's, in, it's in quotes. It's in quotes. So anyway, we will be back next Tuesday at our regular time, 7 Pacific, 10 Eastern. And it's Election and, Day and in Virginia and it, I forgot it was, but yes. And we'll, be, uh, we'll actually be joined uh, by our new regular contributor, uh, Tamara Brown. So uh, make sure that you check that out. And follow us on Twitter, at Trump Report ABTV. For Dr. Christopher Metzler, Chelsea Galicia, at Chelsea Galicia, Scott Moore at S-Man 80. I'm Christian Blatt, at Christian DMZ. Be safe out there. Be aware of your surroundings. Have a happy Halloween, but most importantly, have a safe Halloween. We'll see you next week. Trick or treat. Bye. Bye. From executive producers Maria Menounos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the entire AfterBuzz TV staff, we would like to thank you for listening to the AfterBuzz TV network. To watch or listen to other After shows and post comments or questions, be sure to visit AfterBuzzTV.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of AfterBuzz TV. Buzz you later. The views expressed herein are those of the host only and do not necessarily reflect the views of AfterBuzz TV or its owners or principals. 